We we'll now go to uh, the minister. Uh, sorry, member statements. The member from Prince Edward Hastings. Well, thank you, Speaker. And you know that I love hockey, and you know that this is the inaugural season of the Belleville Senators in the American Hockey League. But this weekend is a very special weekend in Belleville. The Rogers Hometown Hockey Tour is facing off in downtown Belleville this weekend, right across from City Hall. The two-day celebration features free hockey-themed events for the whole family. Saturday's festivities run from noon until 6, and Sunday's start at 1. Highlights include autograph signings by Belleville-born former NHL goaltender and Calder Trophy winner Andrew Raycroft, and Belleville Bulls scoring sensation ex NHLer played for the Leafs for a while, Kyle Wellwood. There's also going to be a parade of champions to honor Belleville's proud hockey history, and we do have a tremendous story to tell, Mr. Speaker, and it'll be on display this weekend. Of course, the Subin family, the famous Subin family, all three boys played hockey with the Belleville Bulls. PK credits his time playing for the former Belleville Bulls as a key factor in his development, and both of his brothers, Malcolm and Jordan, also played for the Bulls. Malcolm's a star right now with the Vegas Golden Knights, who have taken the NHL by storm. You're going to see some highlights if you watch the Rogers telecast on Sunday night, and you may even hear a familiar voice calling some of those P.K. Subban spinoramas uh, during that broadcast. We've got a lot of great um, NHLers that are from Belleville as well. Andrew Shaw with Montreal, Brad Richardson from Vancouver. Uh, Nick Cousins plays for Arizona, Derek Smith, Calgary, Alan Klein, the New York Islanders. The pregame show features Ron McLean and Tara Sloan. Make sure you tune in. 7.30 and some great music by that famous band, the Trans-Canada Highwaymen. Looking forward to uh, Rogers' hometown hockey in Belleville. Member from Timmins, James Bay. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We have to take this occasion to say a little something about all our friends who have come from schools across Ontario in order to uh, find out what this place is all about. But more importantly, Mr. Speaker, they're going to take your chair and they're going to take my chair and they're going to come here and they're going to have a debate. And they're going to talk about the issues that are important to people across this province from the perspective of where they come from. And they're going to find out, as we do, this chamber is all about doing is what's right for the people back home. Uh, sometimes we get caught in the hyperbole of this thing. Uh, sometimes yeah. hyperbole. I learned that word last week. Yeah, yeah, hyperbole. Last week I learned that word. But my point is, we find out that at the end of the day, we're all people that come to this place for essentially the same reason, and that is that we're trying to serve our constituents the best that we can. We're trying to move public policy ahead in a way that makes sense to us. Yes, we have differences of opinions. Conservatives, New Democrats and Liberals look at things from a different perspective, but that's okay. Like that's what democracy is all about. It's about making sure that those ideas come forward, that there is proper debate, and that there's action on those debates. Politics is the art of the possible, of being able to make a difference. And every day that you come to this place and every day that you wake up in this great job as MPP, you have an opportunity to make a difference in somebody's life. And I've got to say, there's no life like it, and I'm very lucky to have done You're it for here. 28 years. Very good. Uh, to change seats. Uh, everybody's changed seats. Uh, the member from York Centre. Etobicoke Centre. Etobicoke Centre. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, last spring, GTAA officials at Pearson Airport revealed that they were considering permanent changes to flight paths along the north-south runways at Pearson Airport, and this would have meant a significant and permanent increase to the number of flights over a number of communities, including mine in Etobicoke Centre. To me, this would have been unacceptable, as it would have massively increased the number of flights, the amount of noise over our community, while doing nothing, nothing, to reduce airplane noise for people across our city or improve airport performance. From the very beginning, Speaker, I have made it clear that I will do everything possible to advocate for my community and fight against this proposal, and I have. I've attended community meetings, I've advocated with GTA and government officials, and have provided many updates to my community. Most importantly, however, the GTAA is eager to build a transit hub at Pearson Airport that requires provincial funding and support, and so I have repeatedly made it clear that I will not support the Government of Ontario providing funding or support of any kind for the transit hub at Pearson if the GTAA moves ahead with its plan to redistribute flights over our community on a permanent basis. And I have great news. 
What is? Recently, the GTA announced that they will not be permanently altering flight paths over yeah. the next five years of our community. Work. Now, while this is good news, Speaker, our work is not finished. We'll have to monitor the GTA's plans in the years to come to see if they change. But this outcome would not have been possible without the efforts of MP Boris Jasnevsky, the Community Alliance for Air Safety, the Markland Woods Homeowners Association, and those who have attended meetings in our community to advocate for this. Rest assured that I will continue my, to, to advocate to ensure the GTA works in collaboration with our community and does not permanently shift flight paths over a tow nice. speaker. Wow. Me member from Chatham, Ken Essex. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. <clears throat> uh, this past Family Day was a fitting day to be present and address a large crowd celebrating the grand opening of the Chatham Hope Haven in my riding of Chatham, Ken Essex. Hope Haven is an emergency shelter for homeless men in my riding. As a nonprofit organization, it helps homeless men with hygiene, food, a safe and non judgmental environment providing warmth from the cold, and food for nourishment. Program Director Mr. Joe Simpson and Pastor Morris Collier and his New Beginnings Ministry received no government funding to keep these men safe. At the moment, they can only allow a maximum of 10 men to stay overnight because of a lack of funding to upgrade their fire alarm system. They need $30,000. Once funding is secured, they will be able to provide overnight accommodations for up to 40 men. Now, because of this, they welcome donations of food, clothing, and hygiene products. The shelter also depends on the help of volunteers striving to improve the lives of those in need within our community. New volunteers are always welcome. Many people on the fringe of society are estranged from their families. They may feel disconnected and unappreciated. They may feel like they have no safe place to go, and many suffer from mental illness or even abuse. The fact that the Chatham Hope Haven has been successful shows the power of civic action and volunteerism. It speaks volumes, uh, sorry, it speaks volumes about the generosity of ordinary people and their capacity for self-sacrifice. Chatham Hope Haven Thank you. is most definitely a Thank safe you. haven of hope. Thank you. That was the third time. I a member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Our public libraries provide extraordinary value to communities, yet because of a 20-year-old provincial funding freeze, they are struggling to provide the services that people count on. In my community, the Waterloo Public Library and the Kitchener Public Library have called for increased funding after the public library grant in Ontario was cut by approximately 40 per cent in the late 1990s. Despite wow. past and present advocacy efforts, the funding has never been restored. Local libraries provide a vital public service. People rely on the WPL and KPL for access to the internet, programming, and community interaction. And for many citizens, Mr. Speaker, libraries address the issue of isolation for vulnerable populations. Just last year, KPL increased the number of cardholders by 20 per cent. They established a new digital space and increased their social media engagement by 34 per cent. And WPL also continues to modernize by offering program programming like outdoor summer jazz concerts, English conversation circles, and estate planning. I'd like to commend the WPL and the Kitchener Public Library for their excellent work. They have strong leaders in both of those libraries, and I hope that the government will join me in recognizing the importance of libraries as a vital public service by lifting the provincial funding freeze. Here, here. The Waterloo and Kitchener Public Libraries have both shown that having fun isn't hard when you've got a library card. Thank you very much, Mr. Here. Speaker. Member from Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hope that uh, all members across the legislature are doing something uh, to support Black History Month in February in their writings. Black Ontarians have helped build this great province and city, and they deserve a little bit of respect during Black History Month. And I hope that the young students who are here from across the province are doing something for Black History Month in their school, because if you don't know your history, you're never going to be able to respect the people around you. In Eglinton Lawrence, uh, next Thursday, we're going to be doing our annual Black History Month, and we're going to be featuring local black artists. The artist that we're going to be featuring is Adrian Sadaway Hales, who is an incredible artist who uh, has undertaken great works on 10-story uh, buildings in Toronto. You can see his work at Young at College. You can see his work on Eglinton, where with uh, spray 
cans, paint. He paints these incredible renditions of our local history. And so this uh, Thursday at uh, BME Christ Church St. James, which is the oldest black congregation in uh, Canada, we will be hosting our annual Black History Month. So I encourage people to support their local artists, whether it be black, red, or white. But we are going to be supporting black artists this Thursday at Christ Church BME. Please honor our black Ontarians this Thursday. Thank you. The member from Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A recent statistic in Sault Ste. Marie suggests that there are over five there are five overdoses per day within my community alone. There is a perception that the opioid crisis is restricted to large urban centers. There is a perception that this crisis affects only marginalized people. These perceptions are wrong. The opioid crisis affects all groups and has become an epidemic in smaller cities across Ontario and Canada as a whole. These communities, particularly those in northern Ontario, are struggling with poor demographics, economic challenges, a lack of growth, and a general sense of hopelessness. These conditions have paved the way for the opioid crisis that we presently find ourselves in. Hospitals and municipal agencies have limited resources to address these concerns. We need to allocate greater resources to combat addictions and mental health. We need to create and foster education initiatives to prevent the spread of addiction. We need to implement measures to limit the production of opioids. And we need to lobby the federal government to make amendments to the C Criminal Code and the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act in order to denounce and deter those persons within the supply chain of these addictive, uh, addictive and often life-threatening substances. It is imperative that we find a way to work together, regardless of our, our respective political stripes, through all levels of government to come up with solutions to resolve this crisis that is destroying families and taking the lives of too many people across our province and our country. Here, here. Thank you. Time for petitions is over. Sorry, member statements. Sorry. Okay. Committees. Two more. Okay, I'm sorry. The member from Oshawa. Ottawa. No, Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this is Kindness Week in Ontario. Hey. And it was almost a decade ago that the member from Ottawa Centre put forward a motion that passed unanimously to create it. And last Friday, I was joined by my colleague, the Minister, uh, the minister of Infrastructure, to kick off Kindness Week in, in Ottawa. So I'd like to thank Dan Greenberg, Accor Village, the Caring and Sharing Exchange, and all the volunteers for all they do to support Kindness Week and Kind Ottawa. And I'd like to say congratulations to CTV's Terry Marcotte on receiving this year's Kindness Award wow. for his work in the community. He received the award uh, from Rabbi Volka, the father of Kindness Week, and I'm proud to say that they are both my constituents. I'm privileged to represent the riding of Ottawa South. In Ottawa South, families from 125 countries have chosen to make it their home. They speak 90 languages, and there are not many places in the world where that happens, and it works. We live together, work together, learn together, our children play together, and there's a glue that binds us together. And one of the primary ingredients in kindness is kindness. And it's important that we recognize and celebrate that. So, Mr. Speaker, happy Kindness Week. Yeah. Yeah. Member statement. Member from Halliburton Court, Lakes Brock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to address an urgent issue in the riding of Halliburton Court, Lakes Brock. Yesterday, correction officers at the Central East Correctional Centre in Lindsay left their posts as part of a refusal to work action because of the unsafe working conditions that they face on the job. Correctional officers in Lindsay have been subjected to 14 assaults at the hands of inmates just this year. Wow. This is not the first time that CECC Lindsay staff have raised the alarm about working conditions, but sadly, every time something like this happens at this facility, the provincial government stays silent. In January, I met with the local corrections officers as well as other staff at the jail to learn about what they face on a day-to-day -day basis. What they told me is that staff are often outnumbered, their workloads are overwhelming, and the facility space itself is completely inadequate. 
The provincial government has a responsibility to ensure a safe working environment for our corrections officers, but they are failing at that job. Enough is enough, Mr. Speaker. This government needs to act now to protect our correctional officers and to address the broader systemic issues that have led to this crisis in here, corrections. Here. They should be focused on practical solutions like hiring additional officers and building new facilities to address overcrowding, which we on this side of this House have committed to doing. I hope they will finally listen to the pleas from the correctional officers in my riding and fix the mess they have created. That's it.